Welcome, everyone. I want to thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Chris Wolforth. I'm the acting director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding. And I have to say that this is the most intimidating introduction I've ever done. I half expect Taylor Mullen to come up with his red pen and correct me as I go. So if I seem a little shaky, it's because I'm slightly intimidated. On behalf of the Dartmouth Center's Forum, your host this evening, I want to thank you for coming. The Dartmouth Center's Forum is a consortia of 11 different centers, institutes, and foundations at Dartmouth engaged in student and public programming. Each year, we select a theme around which we hope to create a campus-wide dialogue. Past themes have included such thorny subjects as religion and politics, technology and freedom, and class divide. For the last two years, our focus has been on communication and particularly fostering civil discourse. Last year, our theme, Speak Out, Listen Up, focused on the challenges of using one, finding one's voice and using it to good effect and being an attentive and respectful listener. This year, we're continuing in that theme by looking at the impact of what we say and how we communicate, hence the theme, Words and Their Consequences. Few individuals are more aptly suited to addressing this theme than Taylor Molly. An educator, writer, and performer, his work explicitly and creatively explores the connections between what we say and how we are heard. It also extols the challenges and imperative of speaking with conviction and of measuring the impact of our words. If you feel the power of his words tonight, it's because he speaks from intense, intentional lived experience and frank self-awareness. Taylor Molly is a poet. He's very fortunate that no diminutive conjunction is required to describe his profession, such as and busboy. He is a four-time winner of the National Poetry Slam competition, has two published works of poetry, and a forthcoming book, What Teachers Make. His YouTube video performance of the poem by the same name has more than three and a half million views. A former teacher, Taylor seeks to recruit 1,000 new teachers through poetry, persuasion, and perseverance. If you are not currently a teacher, be prepared to be converted. We're delighted to have Taylor Molly join us for his first Dartmouth performance and for bringing his poetry and presence to our theme. Opening for him this evening, we are equally delighted to welcome the Soul Scribes, Dartmouth's own poetry performance group. And you can go ahead and clap for the Soul Scribes. <laughs> Founded in 2004, the Soul Scribes have created a place at Dartmouth for the spoken word, performance poetry, and slam poetry. They, too, have selected works this evening to address our theme, Words and Their Consequences. So please join me in welcoming the Soul Scribes and Taylor Molly. our political action, sacrificing our personal, personal autonomy, autonomy, sabotaging original profits again, stoically omitting public, public assent. assent, shitting on people anew, such obnoxious plutocratic assholes, SOPA. Stop online piracy act, selective of privilege and sustained on passive apathy. Society offering potential altruism suddenly ordered to, to protect, protect affiliated, affiliated students of plutocratic, plutocratic aspiration. aspiration. Seriously. Or pay accumulates some obligatory precariousness as systems of public, public announcements survive. Our politicians absorbing syndicate opportunistic pressure act so offices profit always. always. Salivating over pre-aristocratic symbols of power, power. autocrats stupefy, ordering, ordering principleless aims. SOPA. Subtle ostracization perpetuates, perpetuates anger. anger. So odious, privatized amalgamations still, still obtain people's attention. attention. See! <clears throat> Optimum product abates speaker's output. Pulls a societal offering presently away. Stopping, Stopping our, our parliamentary, parliamentary awakening. SOPA. 
sucks out people's awareness, sways opinion, pushes, pushes anti-socialism anti onwards, onwards, pretends authority should occupy positions atop sharing-focused, omni-amorous provinces, accentuates spending on, on proliferating, proliferating arms, arms and security, oppresses, pronounces, and sometimes outspoken progressives, appeases structural ongoing problems, allows suspectless, oblivious persons anti-liberty. Silver, someone outcry, outcry. please, apocalypse seems off-puttingly permeating, and supremacy of pity acronyms, acronyms. safely only promises, promises angst. angst. Soon our predecessors' actions, setting overt precedent, allowing, allowing speech, speech of, of personal, personal answer, answer on proud affections, surely often people act. SOPA, standardization of public aggravation. SOPA, Sopa. surreptitious oblivion of peaceful aggregation. SOPA, Sopa. silencing our, our political, political actions. actions. SOPA, such, such obnoxious plutocratic assholes. SOPA, surely often people act. SOPA, Sopa. shout or, or politics, politics asphyxiates. I don't like going outside without wearing sunscreen anymore because I now know what the sun does to your cells. It fries them and makes them sick and then spits them out and calls it cancer. And cancer makes families sick and then spits them out and calls it, that's how life works. I don't like going outside without wearing sunscreen anymore because I now know what it's like to see someone die from the outside in. To everyone who tells me to worry about things like skin cancer, I now know that you are wrong. The word terminal never meant anything to me before I flew home alone for the first time before I saw George Clooney's star up in the air and before it was placed in front of the word cancer. I don't like phone calls out of the blue anymore because I now know the series of events I can follow my hello. There are the questions. One, are you sure? Two, how did it happen? Three, when? Then there is silence. Then you say, oh my God, followed by more silence. I don't like phone calls in the middle of the night anymore because I now know the series of events I can follow my hello. I don't like driving fast in cars anymore because I now know that sometimes airbags don't deploy, that sometimes safety checks don't occur, and that sometimes the very machines that can give you training and freedom can trap you. I now know what it's like to be upside down, trapped by a seatbelt, and surrounded by glass. I now know what it's like to say, Mom, unsure if she'll answer back. At times I drive like a senior citizen because I now know what it's like to see the person in the other car not get, away, get up and walk away too. To everyone who tells me that I would get to my destinations 10 minutes faster if I drove 20 miles over the speed limit, I'm not so sure if I'd get to my destinations at all. I don't like playing with fire anymore because I now know how hungry it is. To everyone who tells me not to worry about the candle lit in the other room or the match you didn't blow up before throwing in the trash can, I now know that flames don't wait. To the French government who does not make it mandatory to have fire alarms and fire escapes in every Paris city apartment, maintenant je sais. I now know what it's like to say bon voyage and rest in peace to the same person in the same year. I don't like crossing streets anymore. To everyone who tells me that pedestrians always have the right of way, that nothing and no one can hit you, that there are legal consequences for all who don't obey traffic laws, I don't believe you anymore. Because I now know that not everyone knows how to stop. Hey guys, once again we're the Soul Scribes. We have open meetings every Sunday at 9 o'clock in Collis 218. We would love for you to join us. You might not realize, but for a long time I hated poetry. It's just that everyone has had one of those experiences where you're sitting at the back of English class complaining about how the author definitely did not intend for us to spend 10 minutes talking about the first line of the first poem of our token poetry unit. Everyone that is except for that one kid who is kind of annoying because he keeps on employing metaphors for things you didn't even know were in the poem to begin with. And that makes you really nervous because it seems like he knows what he's talking about. So it's seeming like you don't understand the meaning, like you don't comprehend what it's actually achieving, like you don't appreciate the feeling that you get from reading words written in perplexing syntax, taxing on your lexicon because you can't quite see the difference between epistrophe and antistrophe. You're trapped between tropes traipsing about and you have no hopes of ever figuring it out because you you don't get poetry, and you're right, you don't get poetry. 
Poetry gets you. Poetry gets you hype when you hear the correspondence and consonants of consonants that keep time with the rhythm and rhyme of each line. And you might not realize that those last two lines rhymed rhyme and line, but the assonance was so effortless that you didn't even mind. Or perhaps you were simply too distracted, allured by the alliteration of rhythm and rhyme, which themselves rev like an engine, firing up, about to take off and leave you behind with something more than you had before. And you might not realize, but poetry just got you something because you don't get poetry. Poetry gets you. Poetry gets you to feel something with soft sibilant S's and Z's that sound like they're sighing or sometimes stutter as they're crying or sometimes poetry makes you realize something awful like the fact that one out of every six women in this room has been sexually assaulted. One out of every six. And repetition rips apart the soul when you start talking about things like that. And you might not realize, but feeling something from poetry happens all the time. It's why it's so cute when kids speak, because they don't create clauses, they don't play with paragraphs, they speak in stanzas. Their words sing in the prose for prose. And that's poetry getting you something, because you don't get poetry, poetry gets you. Poetry gets you to realize things that you didn't at the start, like the fact that the word cleave means both to come apart and to cling to, because language is funny and sometimes punny, like the things that you most wish you could undo are those that seem the most undo. If you are a warrior with words, always winning in battles of verses versus sentences, then you can astound with words and sound, because wordplay slays people, stays with people, makes people orally obsessed with or love transfixed by the work of the tongue in speech because words sound sensuous in verse but in prose the inverse and even when you think you love poetry you might think you get poetry but you don't poetry's got you and poetry's got me and you might not realize but that's the way poetry is meant to be One more time, please, put your hands together for Soul Scribe. That's how I like to be warmed up. The wisest woman in the eighth grade, or just for tonight, words and their consequences. I tell Diana, that I'm leaving to go teach at an all-boys school. And she tells me that she thought I knew better. You, of all people, Mr. Molly, I would have thought you had learned by now that girls rule. <laughs> and I want, to make you, I want to say, what makes you think I haven't? Or perhaps, what makes you didn't think, you didn't realize that you taught me that yourself? Or perhaps, no. I have to remember that this is the girl who held my hand, the eighth grader who held my hand on the camping trip to keep her balance when she sneezed and said, post sneeze, if it's true what they say, that sex is even better than this, then I can hardly wait. <laughs> perhaps it was then that I understood how close we live to serious disciplinary action. <laughs> How rarely are we more than one sentence away from chaos, tears, emotional wrecks, and wrecked careers. How words have consequences. We haul the barges of our own destruction behind us with lines we choose never to throw out. Words have power, not like engines, like atoms. You can split your whole life apart if you gather all the wrong words together in the right place. Even a single letter can work wonders if you write it well or cry it or mean it. 
So even though I teach at an all-boys school now, God bless you, Diana. God bless you. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I'm doing a mix of old and new poetry and <clears throat> roughly tied together using words and their consequences as my, as my medium. As that's, that's not what I mean to say, but you know what I mean. <laughs> my medium. I think what I meant to say was... <coughs> In case you didn't notice, it has somehow become uncool to sound like you know what you're talking about, you know, or believe strongly in what you're, you know, like, saying. <laughs> Invisible question marks and parenthetical you knows, and you know what I'm saying, have been attaching themselves to the ends of our sentences, even when those sentences aren't like questions, <laughs> you know. Declarative sentences, so-called because they used to, like, you know, declare things to be true, okay, as opposed to other things that are, like, totally, you know, like, not. <laughs> They've been infected by this tragically cool and totally hip interrogative tone, as if I'm saying, don't think I'm a nerd just because I've, like, noticed this. I have nothing personally invested in my own opinions. I'm just, like, invo inviting you to join me on the bandwagon of my own uncertainty. What has happened to our conviction? Where are the limbs out on which we once walked? Have they been like chopped down with the rest of the rainforest? You know? Or do we have like nothing to say? Has society just become so filled with these conflicting feelings of bleh that we've just gotten to the point that we're just like totally just like absolutely just like whatever <laughs> and so actually our disarticulation uh ness it's a noun right our disarticulation nosity is just a clever kind of a it's like this uh it's like a, a thing <laughs> that we put up in front of us to disguise the fact that we've become the most aggressively inarticulate generation to come along since you know, like a long time ago. <laughs> so I implore you, I entreat you, and I challenge you to speak with conviction, to say what you believe in a manner that bespeaks the determination with which you believe it. Because contrary to the wisdom of the bumper sticker, it is not enough these days to simply question authority. You got to speak with it, too. Thank you. This is actually the third time I have visited the Dartmouth campus. I read here once before, but then before that, when I went to Bowdoin, I came here because there's a chapter of the, the, the co-ed fraternity that I belonged to at Bowdoin had a chapter here that was not co-ed. And it, I don't know whether... Is Cy Yu still on campus? <laughs> <clears throat> well, Cy Yu at Bowdoin, Kappa Psi Upsilon, was the pot smoking, co ed, feminist, English major, <laughs> artsy Euro trash, <laughs> ultimate frisbee, deadhead. <laughs> fraternity. So Psi Upsilon had a regional convention and my brothers and sisters came here and met with the, the Psi U's here. And we realized that if we all went to the same college, we would not be all in the same fraternity. And here is a, I don't know whether this would happen at the SIU here, but at, at SIU at Bowdoin, there was, in the boys' bathroom, there was a poetry wall. 
which was where you would expect to see the smut report. And the smut report was, you know, little limericks about who was sleeping with whom. And I certainly dished out some of my early doggerel insulting my brothers and sisters on, on the wall of the, of the boys' bathroom. But this poem is about the time that I woke up and realized that I had been included in a, a little rhyming piece, not rhyming, a little piece called The Seven Deadly Kappas. And that's what it is. The Seven Deadly Kappas for the brothers and sisters of Kappa Psi Upsala. I tell my wife about the seven deadly kappas, that list of famous biblical sins that appeared one morning in permanent marker on the bathroom wall of my fraternity, revised so as to include with each sin the name of one brother or sister in the house who seemed best to represent it. The black ink always bled to the surface every time it was painted over. I tell my wife that I was on that list, and I ask her to guess my sin, thinking she might at first say lust, but admitting secretly that she might just as easily say gluttony <laughs> or sloth, and never guessing that she would take my hand tenderly in hers and nail it, saying, you were envy, weren't you? Immediately, the shocked, hidden, indelible hurt wells up again inside me. How could I be envy? How could anyone ever think that I was envy? How could I have carried these words under my skin for all these years and not bled before now? It hurt. It hurt so bad. It hurt... When, when, it, when I saw that I was envy, I knew Carol was going to be lust. <laughs> and Carney was going to be gluttony. And Mike was going to be sloth. But Marie Elizabeth, my wife, didn't know that. So I said, yeah, I was on that list. Guess, guess what I was? And she said, envy. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> 20 years ago, somebody said the same thing. And it just... It hurt, and so I read that poem just because words hurt. And they say, if you can never remember, if you try to name the seven deadly sins from memory, the one that you will forget is the one you are guilty of. That's too easy for me, because I think I know them. So I'm going to make it harder. Note to self, probably never do this again by naming the seven deadly sins alternately with the seven dwarves. <laughs> and seven wonders of the ancient world. Let's see how far I can get. Pride. Happy. The pyramids. Lust, Doc, the Hanging Gardens of Ziggurat. Oops, we're at the two. Envy, Grumpy, Grumpy, I said Grumpy, the Colossus at Rhodes, Sneezy. Sloth, the temple, of, the temple of Artemis, bashful, anger, the statue of Zeus at Olympus. Yeah, never do this again. <laughs> Have I said uh, lust, envy, envy, sloth, gluttony? 
I haven't said gluttony. Gluttony. <laughs> Sleepy. There are a couple of big ones. I'm. Oh, the Temple of Ephesus. Ephesus. Is there, is there anybody who knows the seven? Can somebody correct me if I'm wrong? The Great Wall of China. <laughs> My living room. We'll just say that's correct. And the and seven would be. Pride. I said it already? Good, because I would hate to have that be the last one that I forgot. Pride, envy, sloth, gluttony, anger, greed. That's the set. Greed. I said happy. Doc. Bashful. Sleazy. <laughs> sleepy. Sneezy. Grumpy. I've said all of those. There's one. There's one left. Bashful, happy. What? Dopey. Dopey. <laughs> Maybe that says something about me too. Dopey. Dopey. And now I just have a. a right. The Sphinx is not one. The Colossus at Rhodes, I said. The Pyramids, the Hanging Gardens of Ziggurat, the Statue of Apollo, Temple of Artemis, Ephesus. Can somebody Google that shit? <laughs> the Lighthouse at Alexandria. OK, great. Thank you. Never do that again. Didn't I say that? It's the hanging, it is a ziggurat. It is the hanging gardens of Rhodes. Oh, oh, Sunday nights, I lie in bed awake, as all teachers do, and wait for sleep to come, as though sleep were the last student in my class to arrive. My grading is done, my lesson plans are in order, and still sleep wanders the hallways like Lower school music. I'm a teacher, this is what I do. Like a builder builds, or a sculptor sculpts, a preacher preaches, and a teacher teaches. We are experts in the art of explanation. I know the difference between the questions to answer and the questions to ask. That's an excellent question. What do you think? If two boys are fighting, I break it up. But if two girls are fighting, I wait until that shit's over, and then I drag what's left to the nurse's office. <laughs> I'm not your mother. I'm not your father. I'm not your jailer. I'm not your torturer. I'm not even your biggest fan in the whole wide world, even though sometimes I act like all of these things. I know you can do these things that I make you do. That's why I make you do them. I'm a teacher, and that's what we do. We're miracle workers. Once in a restaurant, when the waiter said, can I bring you anything else? And I said, no, thank you, just the check, please. And he said, oh, come on, how about a look at the dessert menu? I knew I had become a teacher when I said, what did I just say? <laughs> please don't make me repeat myself. In the quiet hours of the dawn, I write my assignment sheets, and then I print them without spell checking them, because I'm a teacher, and teachers don't make spelling mistakes, do we? So as a matter of fact, the new school dress cod <laughs> will affect all members of the 5th, 6th, and 78th grades. And if you need an extension on your essays examining the pubic wars from a hysterical perspective, you may have only until January 331st. I hope that's not a problem for anybody. I like to lecture on love. I like to speak on responsibility. At the drop of a hat, I will talk about honor and integrity and the importance of telling the truth always. And when my students say, Mr. Molly, are we going to be responsible for this? I say, if not you, then who? You think my generation's going to be responsible for this? We're the ones who got you into this mess. Now you are our only hope. And when they say, what we meant, Mr. Molly, is are we going to be tested on this? I say, every single day of your lives. <laughs> Once. Once. While a student was digging in her backpack for a pen, I put on the corner of her desk a pen. But she didn't see me do it. So when I crossed the classroom and she raised her hand, still not seeing the pen that I had put on the corner of her desk, and said, Mr. Molly, do you mind if I borrow a pen from you? I went, <laughs> She 
She still didn't see it. You already possess everything you require to succeed, including a pen. For a second, she still did not see the pen that I had put on the corner of her desk, but said instead, Mr. Molly, you are probably the weirdest teacher I have ever had. Could you please just loan me a pen? Oh my God! You're a miracle worker. How did you do that? And I wanted to say all I did was give you what I knew you needed before you knew you needed it. So thank you for the compliment, but education is the miracle. I'm just a worker. I'm a teacher, and that's what we do. Thank you. When I found out that the theme was words and their consequences, it, it sounds negative. It sounds, instantly the human mind says, better not say that because there will be consequences. So I wanted to talk about words that have good con consequences. And this poem is called Reading Aloud. Aloud spelled as in permitted, not out loud. But of course, I'm a poet, so I mean both of those things as well. And it sounds like it's going to be dirty, but it's not really. Which is not to say that I won't go there later, but you don't have to take your children out yet. Reading aloud. Maybe I met her in a restaurant. Maybe I met her in a bar. Maybe I saw her while stopped at a stoplight driving down the street in my car. And maybe it started out great, like it does with every woman I've dated. Amazingly passionate, amorous lovemaking, totally caffeinated. But no matter how varied our sex life, eventually, when we're in bed, women always ask me to do the same thing. And it's starting to mess with my head. I feel I'm being used, maybe even abused. I'm trapped, and she is my captor. She'll be naked on her back, and she'll give me a look and say, I want you to read another chapter. Women always ask me to read to them. They demand it. I have no choice but to spread wide the pages of the book on the nightstand and get busy giving good voice. Because <laughs> once upon a time, we grew up on stories and the voices in which they were told. We need words to hold us, for the world to behold us, for us to truly know our own souls. So I read them the Chronicles of Narnia and the education of Little Tree, and they close their eyes and listen as I did when these stories were read to me. All of my siblings and all of our friends, sometimes it was quite a crowd, would gather to listen to my mom or dad as they began to read out loud. A different voice for every princess, every knight, and all of the dragons. And when my mom read Tolkien, you could actually tell the difference between Frodo and Bilbo Baggins. We spent so much time reading out loud on long drives or nestled in reading nooks. Much of the man that I am today was influenced by all the good books that my mother and father read to me when I was no more than a child. So I know why the caged bird sings, and I know the call of the wild. Charlotte's Web, Watership Down, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry, The Diary of Anne Frank, A Wrinkle in Time, and The King Must Die. Read to your children all of the time, novels and nursery rhymes, autobiographies, even the newspaper. It doesn't matter. It's quality time. Because once upon a time, we grew up on stories and the voices in which they were told. We need words to hold us, for the world to behold us, for us to truly know our own souls. And bring your babies to poetry readings. The guy who drove me up from Manchester Airport said, oh, what are you going to be doing at Dartmouth? You're going to be reciting poetry. Oh, you're a poet. Does your stuff rhyme? I said, yes, it does, actually. Okay, then. 
I think I would still be walking here if, it, if it, I didn't write in rhyme. I love rhyme. There's a big dog running for all he's worth so fast his feet don't seem to touch the earth and his name is Bodhisattva. And he's got four legs. And Bodhi lives in an area of Oakland, California, popular with lesbians and Democrats. Democratic lesbians flood the coffee shops and the bars. Republican lesbians live elsewhere, like <laughs> Mars. <laughs> and Bodhisattva runs like a happy fool, scaring the girls at the corner public school who cry, Oh my God, it's a dog! I hate dogs! But who cried the day Bodhisattva almost died, struck by some idiot with a pickup truck. Bodhi recovered, except for one leg in the front, which atrophied, so if you asked him to beg, he'd sit and he'd offer up the leg that didn't work, as if to say, here, please take this from me, it hurts. But his owner didn't know that that's what he was doing, until one night he found Bodhisattva chewing on the withered limb in the living room, alone, drunk on the taste of his own blood, chewing his arm down to the bone, as though through pain, simply trying to prove it still existed, or maybe just to remove it. He's a big dog running for all he's worth, so fast his feet don't seem to touch the earth, and his name is Bodhisattva, and he's got three legs. That's right, they took him to the vet, they had the leg chopped off, cremated, and kept in an urn aloft on the mantelpiece over the fireplace, so whenever Bodhisattva came near that place, you couldn't see it, but he'd sit and he'd beg, offering up his missing limb to the ashes of his missing leg. And just so you know, when Bodhisattva peed, he still peed like a boy dog. There was no need to sort of squat like a girl dog in the middle of the street. He would lift up his leg and he would rest it on the tree or the hydrant or the side of a picnic table. He'd make three points of contact and therefore stay stable. <laughs> He'd look at the girl doggies and say, what you looking at, bitch? And he still scared the girls at the corner public school, a three-legged dog being scarier as a general rule than the regular four-legged kind, more extreme. Oh my God, it's a three-legged dog, they would scream. And so it went, as many years passed, Bodhisattva running fast past the houses of the lesbians and the Democrats, who in general favor smaller dogs and cats. <laughs> Until there came a day when Bodhisattva couldn't go outside, and soon after came the day when Bodhisattva died and his owner had him cremated. But then to ease his soul again, he added the ashes of the missing leg to make Bodhisattva whole again. The people of Oakland have seen strange sights. It's a ghostly figure late at night. It's a big dog running for all he's worth. So fast, his feet don't seem to touch the earth, and his name is Bodhisattva, and he's got four legs again. Thank you. I'm going to read a couple of older poems right now. As Chris mentioned in her introduction, I have a goal of creating a thousand new teachers. When I put my teaching career, I used to be a middle school teacher and middle and high school teacher. My degree is in English literature from Bowdoin College and Kansas State University. And of course, I put that to good use teaching math and, <laughs> and history. And when I put that career on hold in June of 2000, just to see whether I could make a living as a professional poet, because between being a teacher, which I loved, and being a professional poet, this is the road less traveled. And I did not want to be on my deathbed and think, I never gave it a shot. And it seems, it, it's... It's worked out, and I'm having a blast, and I still get to teach. But later on that year, in 2000, I noticed that I, three or four people had come up to me and said, you know, because of your work, at least in a small, indirect way, I've decided to become a teacher. So I kept track in a very unofficial way, and I would say, hey, I think you're about the ninth person to tell me that. I don't know why that's funny, but... It started happening enough that I thought, you know what, I'm going to make a goal, and I'm going to give myself a deadline. I will create 1,000 
teachers by the way I talk about the teaching profession in six years, by 2006. Yeah, that didn't happen. <laughs> Over the years, I've given myself a couple of deadlines. I've added new stipulations that when I get my thousand teachers, I'm going to cut off 10 inches of my ponytail and donate it to a locks of love type organization called Pantene Beautiful Lengths. They make wigs for women battling cancer. And I'm still going to do that. And now I've given myself a new deadline, which is April 7th. I'm at, I just tapped, by which I mean topped, 900. Yesterday I topped 900. So I need 90 something, 90 something people to go to my website, which is exactly what you would think it would be, taylormolly.com, and look for the project called the New Teacher Project, and tell me in however many words you want, I think there's a limit of a thousand, how my work might have influenced you. And if you know somebody, like, oh, you know what, my roommate is, said they, she became a teacher because of your work. Send them. I need this. I don't want to have to postpone it again, and I'm not. And it's usually this poem that pushes people over the edge and makes them say, I've decided to give up engineering and being a teacher. And this is called What Teachers Make, or Objection Overruled, or Bobby Snaps in the Front Row, or If Things Don't Work Out, You Can Always Go to Law School. He says the problem with teachers is what's a kid going to learn from someone who decided that his best option in life was to become a teacher? I'm sorry. <laughs> huh? He reminds the other dinner guests that it's true what they say about teachers. Those who can, do. And those who can't, teach. I'm sorry. I decide to bite my tongue instead of his. And resist the urge to remind the other dinner guests that it's also true what they say about lawyers. Because we're eating, after all, and this is supposed to be polite conversation. <laughs> I mean, you're a teacher, Taylor. Come on, be honest. What do you make? And I wish he hadn't done that. <laughs> Asked me to be honest. Because, you see, I've got this little policy in my classroom about honesty and ass-kicking, which is, if you ask for it, then I have to let you have it. <laughs> you want to know what I make? I make kids work harder than they ever thought they could. I can make a C plus feel like a congressional medal of honor, and I can make an A minus feel like a slap in the face. How dare you waste my time with anything less than your very best. I make kids sit through 40 minutes of study hall in absolute, no, you may not ask me a question. No, you cannot work in groups. Why won't I let you go to the bathroom, Bobby? Because you're bored, and you don't really have to go to the bathroom, do you? I make parents tremble in fear when I call home at around dinner time. Hi, this is Mr. Molly. Hope I haven't called at a bad time. I just wanted to talk to you about something that your son said today in class to the biggest bully in the grade. He said, hey, why don't you leave that kid alone? I still cry sometimes, don't you? It's no big deal. And that was the noblest act of courage that I have ever seen. I make parents see their children for who they are and who they can be. You want to know what I make? I make kids wonder. I make them question. I make them criticize. I make them apologize and mean it. I make them write, 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 and then I make them read. I make them spell. Definitely beautiful. Definitely beautiful. Define nightly. Be a beautiful until they will never misspell either one of those words again. I make them show all their work in math class and then hide it on their final drafts in English. I make them realize that if you've got this, then you follow this. And if somebody ever tries to judge you based on what you make, you give them this. Here, let me break it down for you so you know what I say is true. Teachers make a goddamn difference. Now, what about you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the reason, I, the reason I'm not going to postpone my thousand teacher hair, ponytail haircut is that that is also the unofficial day 
that my new book comes out called What Teachers Make in Praise of the Greatest Job in the World. It's my first book that is not poetry. It's essays and reflections on teachers and uh, on teaching. And I'm very pleased with it. And this is one of only a handful of uncorrected proofs to be sent out to reviewers. And it, the real one is going to be hardback. And I would, oh, and you can all please go visit the merch table in the back and Etal, visit Etal and Amy. Is it Etal? Etai. I just christened you Etal. <laughs> Etai. E visit Etai and grab a bookmark for that that promotes the book, but it's also a temporary tattoo that says tough teacher. So if you have a tough teacher, or if you are a tough teacher, or had a tough teacher, pick one of those up. I'm going to read you a short chapter from this book, which comes out on April 7th. It's called Definitely Beautiful. Funnily enough, when I perform the poem, What Teachers Make, in front of large groups of people, and not always necessarily teachers, I always see nodding heads when I get to the line about sp making my students spell the words definitely and beautiful over and over and over again until they will never misspell those words again. Sometimes when I perform the poem live in front of groups of people, I add the word business also so as to create my own personal trifecta of misspelled words. Definitely beautiful business. I learned how to spell the word definitely in ninth grade from my English teacher, Stuart Moss, who sang for the class the Definitely Song, a mnemonic device that he swore would teach us how to spell the word definitely correctly forever. It has a high, sweetly melodic tune, and it goes something like this. There is no A indefinitely. Absolutely no A indefinitely. That's it. That's the whole song. The entire freshman class stared at Mr. Moss and said, that's the song that's supposed us to teach us to spell the word definitely correctly for the rest of our lives? That's not going to work. I'm going to forget that before I go to sleep tonight. But that was in the fall of 1978, <laughs> and I still remember it perfectly. Beautiful, which does have an A in it where you would not expect, doesn't have a song that goes with it. But it sticks in my head because of a particular light bulb moment. The summer after my ninth grade year, my parents sent me to summer school because they said I had sloppy work habits. And they were right. During my humanities class, I sat next to a wrestler named Larry. And one day, Larry asked the teacher how to spell the word definitely adding that he had never been quite sure, but he thought it was time to learn, and he could finally remember if she would just tell him. She told him to look it up, but warned him that it would probably take him the remaining 20 minutes of the period just to find the right dictionary page, and she was right. And when Larry finally found the word, he kept repeating the first four letters out loud, incredulously, as we packed up our things and headed to lunch. B-E-A-U? That's how it starts? B-E-A-U? That's how you start spell beautiful? I never would have guessed. He said it so many times that some of, some of us began to parody the four-letter litany of his astonishment. But deep inside, I was actually grateful. Larry wasn't the only person who had never been entirely sure how to spell the word beautiful. But now we're both sure to remember. Needless to say, I have sung the Definitely song in classrooms full of students hundreds of times. Sometimes I even sing it through twice, as I did in, at Dartmouth College on January 19th of 2012 adding extravagant musical flourishes while channeling my inner lounge singer. But I have no evidence to suggest that my need for more stage time has improved the power of the original. What's more, 
Every time I have told the story of how I learned to spell the word beautiful, it ends with my own students listing off the first four letters in their own dramatic and deliberate renditions of Larry the Wrestler's Grateful Wonder. But there is a larger point about these two backstories that I really wish I had managed to work into the poem somehow. The exhilaration that comes with all epiphanies, those unforgettable bursts of new understanding. We tend to think of learning in the same way that we imagine a child grows over time, slowly and steadily, with marked spurts of accelerated progress. But the process of learning is more like a series of minor and major lightning bolts that strike the brain constantly. And if you've ever witnessed one of these moments occurring in someone else, then you know why teachers say it's one of the secret joys of the profession, especially if they helped make it happen. What do teachers make? Teachers make lightning strike over and over again. Now, what I would like to do now, I'm donating my hair to Pantene Great Lengths. I would like to auction off this copy of the book to the highest bidder and donate the money to the American Cancer Society. Is there someone who would pay $20 for this limited, uncorrected proof? 20 30 $30. Uh, increasing, increasing donations, what is it called, bids? Increasing bids must be in increments of $5 or more, so you're good. 30 going once, 30 going twice, 40, I hear 40. I heard 35 and I heard 40, am I wrong? Didn't I hear somebody say 40? All right, this limited edition copy, including my set list for Dartmouth, <laughs> which is on the back of a letterpress edition of How Falling in Love is Like Owning a Dog, which I will read next, Go for, 40, for $50 going once, $50 going twice, going three times, sold for $50. Give that person a round of applause. And I'm going to do two more poems. And can you go pay Itai right now? It's you. It's you. All right. No, but you go pay. And she, life is unfair. What? <laughs> Here's a poem that I wrote for a wedding called How Falling in Love is Like Owning a Dog. And it's been read at so many weddings that it's now available as a letterpress. If you know somebody who's getting married, it's a great gift. How falling in love is like owning a dog. First of all, it's a big responsibility, especially in a large metropolitan area like Hanover. <laughs> so think long and hard before deciding on love. On the other hand, love gives you a sense of security. Because when you're walking down the street late at night and you have a leash on love, Ain't nobody going to mess with you. Because crooks and muggers, they think love is unpredictable. Who knows what love could do in its own defense? It may lunge at your throat with its pointy teeth. Meow! Meow! <laughs> On cold winter nights, love lies between you and lives and breathes and makes funny noises. <laughs> love wakes you up all hours of the night with its needs. Love needs to be fed so it will grow and stay healthy. Love doesn't like being left alone for long, but come home and love is always happy to see you. It may break a few things accidentally in its passion for life, but you can never be mad at love for long. Is love good all the time? I'm actually asking you. <laughs> is love good all the time? No. No! <laughs> no! Love can be bad. Bad love. Very bad love. Love makes messes. Love leaves you little surprises all over the apartment. 
Love needs lots of cleaning up after. Sometimes you want to get a piece of rolled up newspaper and swat love on the nose, not so much to cause pain, but just to let love know, don't you ever do that to me again. Bad love. <laughs> Sometimes, God help you, you just want to get love fixed. <laughs> but most of the time, love just wants to go out for a nice long walk. Because love loves exercise. It'll run you around the block and leave you <gasps> panting, breathless, or wrap itself around and around and around you until you're all wound up and you cannot move. Throw things away, and love will bring them back. Again and again and again. But most of all, love needs love. Lots of it. And in return, love loves you and never stops. Thank you. I'm thinking you can handle two more, and that's probably just about right. How does that, if you, if you think you can handle two more, on the count of three, clap twice. One, two, three. Awesome. I would love to have one guy who wants me to stop just go. <laughs> when I say love, I actually mean hate. So I'm going to skip over, go see Itai and Amy in the back. This is my first book. A lot of the poems from, that I have memorized, what teachers make are in here. This is, this is in hardback and in soft cover. This is going to you. This is a poem called uh, On Girls Lending Pens, and the entire text of the poem is on a little pull-out screen like that. If you play Scrabble, it also has the 101 acceptable two-letter words with their definitions on the back. Who can tell me what the first acceptable word in Scrabble is and its definition? Ah-ah uh -uh is a type of lava. And I will give you this. Were you in my class? You were not. OK. I will give you this one pen if you can name. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. 16 two-letter words that begin with A. If you will name 10 of them, I will, or nine more, I will give you this pen. Ab, what's an ab? Yes, but that's an ab. I'm giving you that one. What? As, yes, I know you know what that is. That's three. I've decided this is not as fun. Keep going. Add four. A E. What does it mean, though? Okay, you don't get credit for it unless unless I change my mind. Keep going. A H. Ah, yes. Am. Am. Yes. And right. You need. Three more. At. At. Two more. Axe. Axe. Right? One more. And A Y. And A Y, which means what? I. Yes, it means S. Right. Good. Good. Yes. <laughs> that was not one of the poems that I'm doing. Can you? I'm just going to take a sip of lemonade. I'm, this, and this is also not one of the poems. I know what I'm going to end with. I'm going to end with a poem called The, the Impotence of Proofreading. Bobby, you snap for every poem that I do. It, I'm honored, but I also feel like your standards must not be high enough if every <laughs> single poem is about No, thank you. Never stop. My penultimate poem will be lascivious and disgusting. It's just a question of whether you want me to do a poem about the, the most disgusting thing I ever said when I was 11 years old, or a uh, hideously erotic uh, fantasy I had in an 8 o'clock 
history class at Bowdoin College. <laughs> the very first tape recorders that you could get when I was a kid were about the size of a lunchbox, and you had to press both play and record at the same time in order to get them to record anything. And the condenser mic on them was little more than uh, three little lines flush with the body of the cassette recorder. And if you blew into the condenser mic like this, and I'm going to use this mic sound guy if you are watching me, so you can turn on this mic. If you blew into the condenser mic like this, and then played it back, it made a sound like this. This led to lots of skits about nuclear holocaust and the end of the world and what does this button do? And if you blew into the condenser mic three times fast, like and played it back, it sounded like this. This led to lots of film noir skits and a cowboy and Indian skits and I bet you knew it was going to end like this, partner. And army skits. And it was an army skit that I was recording with my brother when I was 11 and he was 8 that I said the dirtiest thing I have ever said. It wasn't the kind of thing that I thought was appropriate for an 11-year-old boy and his 8-year-old brother. It was, I still maintain to this day, simply the kind of thing that I thought a tough, battle-worn soldier would say, particularly if he were under a lot of pressure to... <laughs> Hold his position, which Jim, the character I was playing in the skit, most certainly was. Jim, can you hold your position, the captain said. I was also the captain. <laughs> and what I made Jim say when he was asked by the captain if he could hold his position was this. Oh, I'll hold my position all right, captain. Just as sure as a man fucks his, his dick. <laughs> that was the toughest, machoist thing that I could think that a soldier would say. Oh, I'll hold my position all right, Captain. Just as sure as a man fucks his dick. Uh, uh. Now, if I could go back in time, I would have the captain ask Jim a few follow-up questions. Like, <coughs> Jim. Yeah. But is that yes or no? Or possibly even, <coughs> Jim. Are you gay? Because it's totally okay if you are, buddy. Or possibly even, <coughs> Jim, how does a man fuck his own dick? We've been talking about it at headquarters. We're not even sure it's anatomically possible. But I think that may have been the moment. I think that may have been the day. I think that may have been the line that made me realize I could become a poet. Because my brother looked at me with wide-eyed cons conspiratorial wonder and said, where did you come up with that? That is pure. Genius. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to do this final poem, and then I'm going to go and sign this book for you and give you this set list. It's right here. And I'm going to hang out right at that table if you want to come over and talk to me. I have had such a great time tonight. It's moments like this that I feel like I'm doing what I was supposed to be doing. If you're a teacher and you think you can help me, go to my website. What else do I always forget to say? Thank you so much, Amy and Chris and the entire organizing group whose name I don't in quite... Dartmouth. Yes, all the Dartmouth centers who... Uh, in... <laughs> Did I not say that right? Okay. Thank you is what I'm trying to say and what I could not improve upon. <laughs> This poem goes out to anyone who has a paper due anytime soon, particularly if you probably should have blown off the poetry reading and worked on it. Has this ever happened to you? You work 
very, very hard on a paper for English clash and still get a very glow rate on it, like a D or even a D equals. <laughs> and all because you are the liver worst spoiler in the whale wide word. Yes, proofreading your peppers is a matter of the, the utmost impotence. <laughs> now this is a problem that affects manly, manly students all over the word. I mean, I myself was such a bed spiller once upon a term that my English torturer in my sophomoric year, Mrs. Myth, she said that I was never going to get into a good colleague. <laughs> and that's all I wanted. That's all any kid wants at that age, just to get into a good colleague. <laughs> and not just anal community colleague. Because I am not one of those guys who would be happy at just anal community college. I need to be challenged. Challenged menstrually. I need a place that can offer me intellectual simulation. So I know this makes me sound like a stereo, but I really felt that I could get into an ivory legal college. So if I did not improvement, then gone would be my dream of going to Harvard, jail, or prison. <laughs> you know, in prison, New Jersey. So I got myself a spell checker, and I figured I was on Sleazy Street, but there are several missed aches that a spell checker can't, can't, catch, catch. For instance, if you accidentally leave out word, your spell checker won't put it in you. And God, for billing purposes only, you should have serial problems with Tory spelling. Your spell check off may end up using a word that you had absolutely no detention of using. Because, I mean, what do you want it to douche? <laughs> no, it only does what you tell it to douche. You're the one who's sitting in front of the computer screen with your hand on the mouth going, clit, clit, clit. <laughs> It just goes to show you how embargo one careless little clit of the mouth can be, which reminds me of this one time. During my junior mint, the teacher took the essay that I had written on a sale of two titties, and she read it. No, I am serial. I am serial. She read it out loud in front of all of my ass mates. It was quite possibly one of the most humidifying experiences of my entire life, being laughed at like that pubically. So do yourself a flavor and follow these two Pisces of advice. One, there is no prostitute for careful editing of your own work. No prostitute whatsoever. And three, when it comes to proofreading, the red penis, your friend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Happy New Year. God bless. Thanks a lot. Have a good night.